But this morning, we are both pleased and honored to have A.D. Frazier here with us to kick off our 2013 Terry Third Thursday series. A.D. is president of Georgia Oak Partners, a private equity firm focused on providing longer-term investment for small and mid-sized companies in Georgia. Georgia Oak Partners was recently featured in the Atlanta Business Chronicle in an excellent article written by Maria Saporta. His partner, Mike Lonegren, a fellow UGA grad, is here with us this morning, so welcome to you, Mike. Glad to have you here. While we would love to claim A.D. as one of our own, he is a Tar Heel, having received both his undergraduate and law degree at Chapel Hill. He also completed the Harvard Business School's Advanced Management Program. A.D. has spent his professional career as an executive manager in the for-profit, not-for-profit, and government sectors of the U.S. economy. His successful career includes involvement with corporate and consumer lending, mergers, acquisitions, and divestitures, strategic planning, corporate governance, HR management, and marketing. A.D. has also held many executive leadership positions, including being the Chief Operating Officer and Second in Command for the Atlanta Committee for the Olympic Games, the President and CEO of Invesco, Chairman and CEO of Denka Business Systems, Chairman of the Board of Goldkiss, President and COO of Caremark, and Chairman of the Board and CEO of the Chicago Stock Exchange. A.D. is the recipient of many professional and civic awards including the Olympic Order in Gold, A.D. was the only COO to receive the IOC's highest service award. He was also recognized as one of the Georgia Trends Magazine's most influential Georgians, has received an honorary Doctor of Business Administration from Piedmont College, and received the Georgia Distinguished Humanitarian Award. A.D. served as an officer in the U.S. Army Reserve for six years. He's a member of the Bar Association of Georgia and North Carolina, and currently serves on the board of directors of the Apache Corporation, a Fortune 500 oil and gas company, and the board of directors of MHM Services, a managed care company. I frankly could use all of our time this morning talking about AD's impressive career, his awards, his accomplishments, and his many contributions to our community. But we are pleased to have him here this morning to share with us his experience and unique perspective on the state roles, the state government's role in economic development. Please help me in welcoming A.D. Frazier. Save that for my obituary. <laughs> I'm glad to be here this morning uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one is uh, to help perhaps put some issues in perspective for you. Now that the legislature is in session, we're going to hear lots and lots of, would you pass me that water please? Lots and lots of good things, bad things, noisy things, and generally foolish things uh, that are, are not going to be helpful to us as a state. But there's opportunity to do better. Um, in 2010, uh, I had, I think, the pleasure of chairing the Georgia Council on Fairness for Taxation, which was a tax council aimed at renovating our to tax laws in totality. And I spent a year doing that. The issues that we faced then are largely the same issues that we face now, um, unfortunately. So we're going to, I'm going to talk about this and say, look, we hear from the, from the chamber, and God bless them, Atlanta chamber, Georgia chamber, was there at the annual meeting the other night, all the good stuff that's going on, and I, I think we should applaud all that but I think we need to be careful about believing our own hype and take seriously some of the things that are going to bedevil us now and bedevil us in the future if we don't fix them. Georgia will soon become the eighth, on the 27th of January, will soon become the eighth largest state in the nation at 10 million, 20,000. We got that way because good weather, good, good right to work, Climate's nice, the, the terrain is nice, the beaches are nice, it's a good place to come, move your company. And we got there um, because by and large the companies up north did, had union labor and we had right to work. 
FYI, Indiana and Michigan just passed right to work legislation. And most of the employees who would move down here have houses that are below their market value. So the chances of, of increasing our business opportunities or jobs because of that phenomenon are probably a little less than they used to be. It was interesting for me to note that in the 1990s, which I think fortunately most of us here remember, we had a 30% increase in jobs during the decade in Georgia. That was seventh highest in the country. Obviously, we're a growth state. In the 2000s, we had a net zero growth in jobs. In fact, over that period of time, we lost over 330,000 jobs. We're one of four states that were behind only California and Florida in that regard, too. We're one of only four states in the country that shed jobs in the year 2011. This is the so-called recovery. And we lost three and a half times as many jobs as the next closest competitor, which was Missouri. We did some work on this and, and, and decided that approximately it's going to take, if we need to get back to pre-recession levels of employment, then we got to add something like 19,000 jobs a month over the next three years. I, like you, celebrate the large uh, increases when big plants decide to come here, Baxter, whoever. Um, but those additions simply are not enough to keep pace. And the reason I want to talk about that jobs issue and the importance of it is because of the budget crisis that the state is in and will continue to be in, which can only be fixed, can only be overcome by increasing jobs in this state. Let me go on. One of the issues about tax reform was trying to find, make the code business friendly. Turns out most companies don't care about corporate income tax anyway. The factors a company looks for to put a job in Georgia are first and foremost trained or trainable labor force. Second one is infrastructure. The third is K through 12 public education. And the fourth is personal income tax rates. Those are the factors that cause a company to want to put corporate income taxes, no income taxes nowhere to be found. In fact, the only time I can find where a corporate income tax really hurt our state was when AFLAC decided to move its domicile to Nebraska because of our insurance premium tax. It, is, it was disappointing to me to see that most of the state voted against the T-SPLOST. I don't blame them for voting against the one here because I think it was a little bit cobbled together. I think the middle Georgia counties are going to benefit from it. Uh, but I, it is unfortunate that even that wasn't successful. I'm talking about infrastructure now. Infrastructure in terms of the Savannah Port and the Atlanta Airport is fantastic and our proximity to other southeastern and actually all the way to Chicago in a day, cities, is a great thing for us. Rail hub, traffic, transportation hub, you name it. And logistics is a big business for the state. We think there are over 600,000 jobs there. But the infrastructure is something that now is an issue for Georgia, and particularly for Atlanta. People who look here simply say, we, we can't put up with this traffic. We can't put up with this mash of governments. It, it's, uh, it's just too much hassle. I like the Georgia highways. I sit on them two hours a day, and I look at the pavement. I mean, that's the sort of thing that's starting to pop up. So we're going to have to do something about infrastructure one way or the other. Personal income tax. Has anybody here ever seen the state budget? Ever looked at it? There you go, thank you. One. The state raises, or will raise and spend this year of state money, probably 18 and a half, 18.8 billion dollars. 
What's little known is that we're going to spend another $11 billion of federal money. So when you talk about cutting back on federal spending, just realize that we are going to get nicked, and we, we'll have to. Large, most of that federal money goes for Medicaid, another 25% of it goes, goes for transportation. Georgia's budget is made up of two major components. The largest, the larger, is the personal income tax. That accounts for about half of our revenue at the state level. Sales tax accounts for about 25 percent. The balance of all the other things, motor fuel tax, et cetera, et cetera, are just not big enough to really move the needle. The 2013 budget will be sl smaller than the budget in 2007, largely because we haven't had any growth, not net growth. By the way, that loss of jobs is more heavily skewed toward the lower income and, and people who don't have a college education. But it's still going on. And the way we've balanced the budget is twofold. One, over the past five years-ish, we've taken almost $5 billion out of K through 12 education, out of K through 12. This year, 1.6 million kids will start school in the fall. And we have fewer teachers and less money than we've had in half a decade. If you want to talk about the qualitative side of that, Georgia ranks 34th in fourth grade math scores in the country. We're down to pack. We rank 26th in reading. We rank 40th in ninth grade, grade math scores. Uh, we're just not getting the job done. We're not getting a job done in public education, and a significant part of that is probably money. I believe it is anyway. FYI, the reason we need more jobs is because the growth rate in Georgia per capita income over the last decade was next to last in the country. I mean, for this decade, we were a no-growth state which put impossible pressures on the budget. So one way we cut the budget was to go where the money is, people. And that's mostly teachers, K through 12 teachers. The other way we cut it was to go into our rainy day reserves. Um, when we started, when Sonny started his tenure, I think our rainy day reserves were about $1.5 billion-ish. These are round numbers. Today, as we go into 2013, our rainy day reserves are just over $300 million. That's about enough to run the state for a day. In order to be where we should be, we need to raise $2.6 billion of reserves to be back to the level we, that the, the state anticipated when it put together the rainy day fund. Personal income tax rates. One of the recommendations we made in 2010, which is still good, valid, is that we should tax the things we don't want and don't tax the things we do want. What does that mean? Well, that says don't tax income, that's what you want, and ta but tax consumption, which you have a choice about making or not. Over the period of the 90s and 2000s, early 2000s, Georgia had a series of tax cuts on income that were offset by economic development, new growth, new jobs, and the like. With the recession, those tax cuts weren't put back in. So as a result, we lost revenue. 2010 was the lowest level of state revenue in 25 years, lowest percentage level of revenue. So in order to deal with this, we're going to have to deal with the issue of taxation on the revenue side, just not just the expense side. 
How many of you have heard of Grover Norquist? Yeah, there you go. A lot more people than have read the budget. Um, I, deb I debated Grover Norquist in the Capitol two years ago. Um, Grover Norquist has convinced about 50 of our legislators to sign his No New Taxes pledge. That's a huge percentage. It, it, frankly, it's almost an impossible one to get over. Now, here's the folly of that. Per capita income taxes, or taxes, state taxes, per capita, Georgia ranks 45th, almost at the bottom. I'll give you two examples. We compete against a number of other states, uh, Virginia and North Carolina, I'll pick two. CNN ranked us as the ninth best place to do business in the country several years ago. They ranked Virginia third and North Carolina seventh. Virginia takes in $2,150 per person in state taxes a year. North Carolina takes in $2,020 in state, state taxes per year. The state of Georgia takes in $1,600 in taxes, state taxes per capita per year. So we're 40% or more behind two other competitive states when we sign this no new taxes pledge. We're already at a disadvantage. Is that, is that clear? Am I making that clear? We're structurally behind two other key states when a legislator in Georgia signs the pledge. So, as I said, there are about 50 um, of our legislators who have signed that. Uh, as you listen to the debate this year in the state budget, please consider whether it's smart to continue to try to cut taxes, to fight over taxes when we're so low at the state level, or whether revenue should be considered as part of the issue in solving our state's budget problem. We talked about jobs. I participated recently in a task force. Oh, let me back up. I've been a part of lobbying at least four different governors to let the state put money into alternative investments. That would be real estate, REITs, private equity, and the like. Finally, Governor Deal signed it, and now the state has hired two so-called pension experts to run that part of the pension program. It's going very slowly, but perhaps we'll make it work. It'll be working. But that money is not earmarked for Georgia investments. Do not expect to see any of that for a while in Georgia investments. You go anywhere. And for fiduciary reasons, it may have to go everywhere. I know this is one of the issues that they're very concerned about. They're concerned about conflicts of interest and all this other business. But the fact of the matter is, that's not going to help us. Now, this year, I participated in a task force with Casey Cagle. We acknowledged, as Mike and I have known forever, that we are underserved from a capital formation standpoint in the state of Georgia. Uh, obviously, bank failures are right at the top of the list, but other than that, we're still underserved. We're underserved by private equity, we're underserved by investors, venture capital, angels, you name it. We're just not a market center. Boulder, Colorado has got a better ecosystem for private equity than Atlanta, Georgia does. In Georgia, nine out of 10 investment dollars, private equity investment, come from out of state. We lose companies regularly because they're started up here, they're perhaps incubated at Georgia Tech. It's a good idea, it's commercializable, and when the, invest and when the entrepreneurs are looking for money, they don't find it here. They find it either in Boston or perhaps more likely in Silicon Valley, some other place. Guess what happens to the companies? 
after five years of incubation, half of them are gone. That's out of our, our state incubation facility. After 10 years, 75% of them are gone. We're providing the R&D, the research for, that's funded and maintained and where jobs are growing in other parts of the country for lack of having adequate investment dollars here in the state. By the way, with the exception of Alabama, every state that borders us, and North Carolina as well, has a fund, public money, that intentionally co-invests or jointly invests with private equity dollars to leverage the impact of that. Even South Carolina. So we proposed, and the Lieutenant Governor is going to propose, I have no idea how far it'll go, that this state set up a Invest Georgia private equity fund, and that the state fund it out of premiums or out of tax credit sales from insurance premium taxes. We may find it out of the fund it out of the one Georgia for year one or two. That's where the tobacco settlement money is put out, ninety million dollars or hundred million dollars ish, is put out to help companies grow in Georgia. We proposed a five-year in-state investment program topping $100 million at the end, uh, and as I said, financing it with insurance premium tax credits. Uh, the, the Lieutenant Governor, his representative, will bring that to the floor of the Senate, and we'll try to get the Governor to go along with it and try to get Dave Ralston to go along with it as well. So the, when I talk about that the, the government has a role in economic development, there are some things the government can do. What we now do, however, is not, um, is not necessarily effective. This is great. Part of our recommendation for the Tax Council was to look at the 116 sales tax exemptions, separate sales tax exemptions in Georgia. A guy named Roy Fickling led that subcommittee. You may know Roy from Macon, a good guy, banker, developer. Our recommendation was to eliminate 30 of them and sunset all the rest. Why is that? Because some of these things have been around for a long time <laughs> without being looked at. We have a sales tax exemption for church bills, for example. Um, I got hammered because we were going to take the sales tax exemption off for Girl Scout cookies. And th those were some of the more ludicrous ones. But by and large, they are 39th Legislative Day deals. They come in under the table. Um, they get passed on the last day and then forgotten. And the only people who benefit from them is the special interest group that went for it and convinced somebody in the legislature to carry the bill for it. We also have 33, through the Department of Economic Development, 33 investment um, um, tax credits. Most of those, in substance, are aimed at this strategy we have of acquiring businesses to the state from other states. And if you look at the way these tax credits are offered, they're staggered throughout the state. They're worth more in Lumpkin County than they are in Fulton County very complex system, very difficult to administer, and unfortunately, nobody, nobody at the state has any idea what the annual revenue give up is. Nobody. Not the auditor, not the treasurer, not the Department of Revenue, nobody. An estimate was done in 2010 that the total of these credits and exemptions could be as much as $3 billion a year. Now, maybe it's worth that, but I'd sure like to have that stuff done in the open, transparent, easy to see, let us know where it's going. So we, pro <laughs> we proposed irrationally, of course, uh, that the state simply have the legislator, legislature authorize a negative tax. Let's say it's $500 million. So we're willing to give up $500 million a year 
to, to, for corporate investments. Some people call it corporate welfare, but I'm not. And the reason it's necessary is because every other state in the country is doing it. We've, we have in, the, in this nation a beggar thy neighbor approach to economic development. Ohio loses one, we win it, and vice versa. And you can know, of course, that there are people sitting in South Carolina and Tennessee and Alabama right now scheming to take companies out of Georgia. So one, we need to, uh, to nurture um, private equity investments or investment money of whatever stroke, stripe. And two, we need to take a serious look at the economic development grants money grants that, or, or money grants that turn out to be supposedly for economic development, see if they're really doing the job. And maybe it ought to be a billion dollars a year. I don't know. But when you think about three billion bucks a year that you have no idea where it went, if that's the total, I think that's unacceptable. So the state does, in my opinion, have a role in economic development partially because every other state's doing the same thing. The state has a responsibility to keep personal income tax rates competitive. 93% of all small business in this country is, is organized under some sub S or LLC type thing that's ignored by the IRS and so it's personal income tax to them anyway. So a lower, the, the people want a lower personal income tax rate, corporate income rate, tax rate doesn't matter. And that's half of the income in the nation is coming from that segment. So for us to really have an impact on job growth, we've got to seriously support small to medium-sized businesses in this state who need cash to grow. And the state can supplement that by matching the other states who are now doing it to put their own pension money or some portion of it, maybe a 10 million bucks, who knows, side by side, so that our bids, our offers look like other offers from other states. So where is all this leading? I believe this very strongly that we need investment dollars in Georgia. And we probably need them more in the sort of prosaic back, backbone economy types of business, logistics, business support, special packaging, small manufacturing, um, because that's where the jobs are going to grow and they're gonna grow from companies over here. So at the very least, the state's gotta adjust the incentive plan to support local business growth as opposed to just focus on bringing people from the outside. The Chamber of Commerce, Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, has just paid Bain a bunch of money to do a study to tell them exactly that. Mike and I could have told them that for free. So that's what we did. Uh, two years ago, a little over two years ago, Mike Lonergan, my business partner, decided to form Georgia Oak Partners for the specific purpose of providing capital to Georgia-based companies that are companies that grow jobs. That's what we did. And I made enough noise about it that he, he decided to let me in under the tent, so we, we're here. We now have two of our associates who are with us. But that's why we're doing what we're doing. And with any luck, after we've made ours, maybe some others will follow our lead <laughs> and become competitive. But we're doing what we can to improve the critical mass of investment dollars that are available in Georgia to grow jobs. And I'll tell you one more time, growing jobs is the only way we get out of this budget disaster, this budget mess. Raising personal income taxes, which is half the budget, not, not an alternative. Our marginal tax rate is uncompetitive at 6% with everybody else in the country. It doesn't have to be zero. In fact, it shouldn't be zero, but it doesn't have to be 6%. And we've got to inc increase the idea of taxing consumption. Several years ago, Zell Miller, you will recall, in a fit of pique, took the the taxes off of groceries for home consumption. Does everybody remember that? Anybody remember that? Big deal. You remember, Tina. You were there. Uh, it's an interesting story how that came about. It turns out that that amount of money is about six to eight hundred million dollars per year that we just walked away from. 
last the couple of year and a half ago when I was doing this stuff, Zell called and said, AD, if you decide to put the tax back on food for home consumption, you'll never hear a word out of me. It was the worst mistake I ever made. So closing, we've got to find ways to raise the revenue side. And if our <laughs> legislators don't have the fortitude to, to say no to Grover Norquist, then we're going to have to focus on creating jobs or we're going to fall further and further behind in those areas that businesses say are essential to corporate growth or location here. Infrastructure, we missed, it, missed the train on that, It'll be a while. Quality of life, not bad. K through 12 education, you heard the numbers. It's, it's horrible. And personal income tax. And if we take all those together, we're going to have a lot of work to do in the legislature ahead. So with that, I'll stop. And somebody asked me about the Olympics a minute ago. I said, gee whiz, I don't even remember. I don't know how old I was then. If you want to talk about the Olympics, I'm happy to do it. But anybody got a question about what we just talked about? Yep. What's your, uh, what's your opinion on opportunity zones? Yes. I, I'm, generally a fan of that. Um, I, I think any of these special efforts are subject to abuse and subject to making more of it than it really is. I mean, I don't think opportunity zones per se are the answer at all. But should we have them? Probably so. But everybody knows where it is. It's not a, something that's under the table, something that you can bid for. Yes? I'm sorry to get your day off to a bad start. I didn't like getting up this early anyhow. Well, I'll give you one example of a tax policy having an effect on that. Uh, one of the recommendations, frankly, one of the few recommendations we made in the tax council that actually passed was to take the sales tax off of energy used in manufacturing and agriculture. Previously, the carpet industry in Dalton pays sales tax of 6% on their energy that they use and the energy they put into a piece of carpet. That's 40% of the cost of a piece of carpet. And I told the papers that if we didn't do something about taking the tax off of energy used in manufacturing, you would never see another carpet mill built in Georgia. And that's true. Because Alabama and South Carolina do not have a tax on energy used in manufacturing. But the same is true of agriculture, which is our, obviously our largest specific industry. And that's another area that the legislature did agree that we should take the tax off of the inputs used in farming. If we can't solve infrastructure problems, if we don't have an environment in the incentive scheme that causes big companies as well as local companies or smaller companies to want to stay here, then we'll continue to bleed off jobs the way we have done in the past. Now, admittedly, most of the ones we lost in that decade were related to construction and finance, and some of the other sectors are coming back, but we still have a huge hole. And if we can't raise taxes, we're going to have to find some other people here. So we got, our incentive scheme needs to be focused more on companies that are here, rather than trying to attract somebody from Ohio. Yes? Uh, I'm pre-World War II, so I guess I'm not... Well, we're pretty I'm, close. I'm in the, the silent generation, in between the so-called yuppies or dual generation and the generation of the uh, 30s, which were the greatest generation. But I've always worked at the lowest entry level in the insurance industry. 
and fortunately I have spent 45 plus years here in Atlanta, fortunately uninterrupted uh, for 40 plus years. I did spend some time in Chattanooga and Louisville, went to school in Columbia, South Carolina, grew up in the Augusta, Georgia area, central Savannah River area. Got a basic education there in Aiken County thanks to the the so-called Savannah River Project, where yep. they got a lot of federal funding. But it's been my observation in Atlanta, this is probably totally unrelated to your very fine comments, likewise to the gentleman there that summed it up, what good job that you did. But the New York banks, when they first came to Atlanta after the banking laws broke everything down and the chemical banks and the city corps, came to Atlanta, they recognized that the people here with their good lifestyles had a large savings margin, and they lived at a very low cost of living. High income, fairly high density, but there's, they were spending a lot less money than the people in the Northeast, and they came down and issued their credit cards to get everybody in debt, and people started spending 30 to 40 percent more they were taking in and taking on additional uh, marriages thus further creating the wealth opportunity build up and their ability uh, to uh, take care of their family so to speak so I didn't know whether or not you wanted to comment on the breaking down of the bank's loss whether you think it affected anything about the growth and development what your subject is I had to be sure what your subject was. You did such a good job on covering the big events and the micro events. I just couldn't help but ask that question. I don't really mean to sort of offer an official opinion about this because banks are banks and we need them. Um, it does bother me that 50 to 60 banks in Georgia fail, largest number in the country. They're all small community banks by and large and almost none of it had anything to do with credit card debt. It had to do with real estate. Uh, that's where everybody took a powder. Um, I was worried about credit card debt until 2012, 11 and 12, when Americans actually started paying that down. So uh, I'm less worried about that, for example, than I am a trillion dollars of student loans that can't be uh, gotten rid of through bankruptcy. That's a whole different story. We talk about funding education then. But I, I don't look at that as, a, as an issue for us. Yeah. Hey, Dean. Um, we've got a proposal for a billion dollar new stadium downtown. 700 <laughs> million would be paid for by the Falcons. 300 300 million would be paid for by a hotel motel, but that requires the state legislature to pass whatever it's called, funding or backing for that for that hotel motel. But 70% of the Georgians are opposed because it has the word tax in it. So would you explain to us the, uh, the model for that stadium and what role Georgia has and, and what, are the, what are the political ramifications? Uh, yeah. <laughs> As you know, um, at the Olympics, we built the Olympic Stadium. We built the Olympic Stadium, as Tina Arbus well knows, with all with private money, not a nickel from the public. $207 million of our money and $34 million of the Braves' money, and you end up with Turner Field. That's like a quarter of a bit, $250 million. Now we're talking about spending a billion dollars, and you know, I think we have a perfectly good dome as it is, but that's my view. The, I expect that this will be a very costly undertaking for the taxpayers. Nobody remembers this, but the hotel motel tax, and it's, the reason it's there was to fund ma marketing for hotel motel industry, for conventions and trade service and everything around the country. We've long since blown that off. I mean, that's not even close. It's used as part of the general revenue. So I'm not sure how the, what, the, uh, what the economics of that will likely turn out to be for the taxpayer. I can assure you this. It's an abuse of hotel motel tax revenue to put it in that project when it's 
supposed to be used for something else. Yep. One of my takeaways today is uh, obviously I think we all heard the, gov the state government needs more revenue. How do you get it and then what do you do with it? Uh, speak to, it strikes me that part of the issue with voter resistance is uh, there's a trust gap between how bureaucrats and legislators spend money that's given to them already. Now, m more of that may be on the federal level than the state level, but it strikes me you gotta, you gotta close that trust gap. Speak to that a little bit about how you, you give the voters more confidence when they give revenue to the state of Georgia. Um, wow. <laughs> that, is, that is an unfortunately good question. Uh, <laughs> Um, the Atlanta Journal Constitution recently did a big poll. You may have seen it. And the point that you made was exactly the point that came out of that poll. We don't trust you. It came out on the re rejection of T plus by five or six to one, whatever it was, because people didn't trust the people who put that program together. I think we have a huge burden and the legislature is part of creating it, but so are the lobbyists. Uh, at the state, local, and, and it's clearly the federal level, um, that people are, are willing, and this survey said this, are willing to spend more money on the things that they need and the things the state or people need, but they don't trust the people who are allocating it to do so without abusing their trust. I think it's probably the number one major issue for us and for probably most every other state in the country. The, the legislative process must be more transparent. I'll give you an example. One of our recommendations was that if you're going to have a tax credit or a tax incentive, you drop the bill in the first year of the legislature, but you can't vote on it until the second year of the legislature. That's the way we do pension plan changes, by the way. So it's not revolutionary. What happens, unfortunately, is that Somebody will put a tax bill in and they won't get around to working on it until the 39th legislative day and they'll jam it in attached to some other bill and it'll go across the aisle and get passed and gone. Generally out of the line of sight of voters, and investors, money, people, you name it. That's unfortunately too often the case. Uh, so to make things more transparent, I would like to do that and give the fiscal research agency six months to analyze as opposed to five legislative days. The fiscal notes are required, by the way, for every piece of legislation that goes through the legislature, an assessment of its impact, financial impact, not just tax bills. But the Georgia State Research folks have five days to analyze this, five. So when you get a flurry of bills toward the end of the session, there's just no way they're ever gonna give you accurate numbers. So trust is a huge issue. Pray, I think. Yes, sir. Where did you find 116 state tax exemptions as a general public? Would you, I got them right over here. Would you like to <laughs> I brought them with me. Um, they're in the, in, the internal revenue section of the laws. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Happy to show them to you. We can find a site for you before you leave. It'll be, it'll be pretty astonishing, the, the variety of things that are sales tax exempt and how they got there. All right, we've, we've hammered this enough. Yes, sir. I don't remember the exact content of what you used it, but um, companies are looking for trained or trainable employees. Yes, that's number one. It's number one, okay. Um, how do you propose or what is your suggestion on how we, with lack of funding or no funding to increase our education level, how do we get the kids that are in school now become trained or trainable? That is great. Um, <coughs> and it has a two-part answer. Part answer number one is we got to put some money back in K through 12 for vocational education. We got to do something for cert certification, be it heating and air specialists or be it whatever. And we got to come out of high school with those vocational education skills to the extent we can. If you think about the jobs in the 21st century, 2015, 2025, thereabout, what are they gonna be in? 
Are they going to be technology related? Are they going to require math skills? Are they going to require engineering skills? And our ninth graders, half of them don't pass the national standard. How can you ever generate a world-class workforce when you can't even meet the, the average of the country? So item one is K through 12 has got a lot of work to do. I think Nathan Deal is behind some ideas that focus on vocational education. I think he's made an issue out of that. I support him, period, paragraph. The other thing we do is when I say trainable workforce is actually we have the best, the best in the country. A program called Quick Start run by the community colleges and the people at NCR who are gonna come in here and do their work, they need 500 people. Quick Start through the local community colleges will train 500 people and deliver them ready to go. That is clearly one of the best things we have in the way of job creation, trained or trainable. And, if we can, and we design these programs to meet every individual company's needs. So it's, it's not like general GED stuff. So those are two answers to, to help do it. But, but clearly, I think Nathan Deal's on the right path in terms of the focus of secondary education, particularly high school. And if we don't do something about graduation rates, I won't go there, we got a, a serious problem. Well, I, sobering, I'm a little bit disappointed about. Maybe realistic may have been better, but I'll take sobering. Um, Thank you for your time and your attention. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> Thank you, A.D., for those insightful and very timely remarks. Um, as a token of our appreciation, um, Loretta E.B. has been commissioned to um, provide these glass sculptures for the Terry College of Business as a token of our appreciation for our speakers, we would like to present this to you. Thank you. After that, I thought you might have given me a bag of switches. So, yeah. <laughs>